Thanks so much, Wendy. Welcome to another exciting edition of Firebytes. We are taking it way back to Back to Basics Firebox 101. Now, I do have to say, unfortunately, um, I have been breathing some wildfire smoke for the last uh, week or so. The AQI has been about 500, so I might need to take a break, um, grab a drink of water. But hopefully everything goes well. I am safe, but we were about two miles from the edge of the fire. So fortunately, all of the loved ones, my loved ones are safe. But getting back to the agenda, Wendy and I oftentimes go out and we do these uh, technical boot camps across the Northwest. And without a doubt, every single time we get someone that says, we need you to take it a step back further we don't have the proper foundation we don't understand this term so we are we came up with this idea of starting a series and we did a last series on multi-factor authentication and with a 30 minute time block we are very limited in what we can cover however if we tie it into a, ser a series we can take that and extend and build on it and then that way you can go back to our youtube videos and view only the content that you need in that particular scenario. So as we looked at what we can plan on for our firewall series uh, overview, back to the basics, I kind of broke it down into several different topic areas. So the first is how to get help. That I feel is the most important way um, or most important for you to figure out, you know, you might be going into VLANs. Where do you go from there? So we're going to cover that. And obviously, these Firebyte sessions are going to be hopefully helpful for you as well. And my goal with every session that I do is that someone leaves with some nugget of information uh, that they had. I might not be able to meet all of your um, wish list items in this series, but for sure, using that QR code, using that survey, that's going to allow us or give us insight into what you're looking for. So how to get help. We're gonna talk about planning your deployment. Some of that might be review for a lot of you. We're gonna cover some of the security services overview, some of the support levels, how to submit for support. Then ultimately, we're gonna get into the Firebox initial configuration, setting up new Firebox, looking at the management tools, configurations, looking at network settings, right? Zones, uh, DHCP, all that fun stuff that you guys use on the daily basis, or perhaps there's some of you that are new to WatchGuard, or maybe you're not even a customer today, and certainly some tips and tricks that will get you um, out the door, off to the races, and running, so to speak. So we're also going to look at firewall policies, packet filters versus proxies, security services, proxies um, in depth, authentication, and logging and monitoring. Now we did have a couple of questions out of the gate on some of the question or um, looking at how do we tell if there's what's being blocked. So unfortunately, Jay, that I did uh, answer that. That is um, okay. Is everyone able to hear me? I'm seeing some responses that it's simulated like a robot. Yes, I double checked. Audio is good. Okay. Just want to oh. confirm. Okay. Yep. Thank you everyone for responding. Got a lot of folks typing in. Okay, so as you can imagine, this series overview is not necessarily going to be covered in 30 minutes and we will just chunk it and um, I can't tell you how long this series will be, but for sure at the end of it, we're gonna cover everything that you guys wanna cover. So thanks for bearing with us. So Firebox 101, how to get additional help. Now I did wanna mention some of this and we'll give you some examples. On a day-to-day -day basis, I refer people to the technical search, some of the technical documentation. That's product documentation, hardware guides. There are a number of very useful video tutorials. The one thing I use almost on a daily basis is configuration examples. And we'll cover what is included with that and then release notes. Now, a lot of you don't realize, um, some of you already do use them, but we actually have user forums where you can connect with your colleagues. We also have some WatchGuard employees in there helping out. But if you had questions or um, frustrations with how to configure different areas, you can also do peer help as well. If you're looking for training, we do have um, training centers throughout the US that you can sign up and go to a training course. 
And then obviously we have this, our YouTube channel, which is WatchGuard Northwest, a YouTube channel, which is where this video will be posted as well. And then lastly, find how to find a WatchGuard partner or hire professional services directly from WatchGuard. So with that being said, I wanted to go ahead and cover um, some of the uh, items, show you where to go. So WatchGuard.com, we can go under support and under technical resources, you'll find a lot of this. So I just wanted to mention, for instance, if I had a question on technical search and I wanted to go in, technical search is an extremely valuable tool because it's going to go through, look at the documentation, knowledge base, the community, videos, and other things as well. So if I wanted to look up, I see their SSL VPN, but if I wanted to look up, for instance, IPS, maybe there's a signature about it, or I had some questions on intrusion prevention, I can simply go in, click on this, and it gives me real life information on um, info that's applicable to that uh, search term. So that is the technical search. Now we also have a product documentation. This is a wealth of knowledge as well. So if I go back here to WatchGuard and I go to support technical documentation. Under um, technical documentation, I see product documentation, hardware guides, quick start guides, video tutorials, configuration notes, and release notes as well. So configuration examples. So if I wanted to, as an example, look at a configuration example. Oftentimes I hear people say, well, how can I do a failover? Um, perhaps you're looking at having a, um, moving away from MPLS and you wanna spin up a um, branch out of VPN over a private link. Here's a um, VPN failover from a private link in that scenario. There's also um, branch of VPN with OSPF, using public IP addresses behind a Firebox, and it includes the configuration files as well. So extremely helpful if you click on this, um, and you can just download the XML files. So you see the different scenarios and pictures to um, go along with those scenarios. So from a technical standpoint, this is extremely helpful um, to figure out how to have host maybe a mail server with a public IP in this mixed environment. And then as I mentioned, we also have a video tutorial. So I'm not gonna obviously go through that, but I just wanted to show you some of those resources. And again, some of this might be review for a lot of you, hopefully it is. But in case you're not familiar with it, we also have, uh, for instance, multi-factor authentication videos. We also have uh, proxies getting started with these individual um, services. We also have um, getting started with your Firebox, activating, so we have all of these resources as well for you. And then obviously the release notes are going to be able to show you what was um, released in what version. Now I did wanna mention as well the user forums. So under user forums, you have all of these discussion areas. So if I wanna go under Firebox and I wanna say, okay, well, I had a question perhaps on, um, let's see, Firebox hardware, and go in here and look at um, different areas or ask my custom question as well. So very helpful for you guys to have that community resources available for you. And then we also have, uh, so under partners, you have, um, find a reseller, technology partners. The other thing that um, I hear a lot of questions on is can WatchGuard work with a particular SIM? And that is now part of our technology partner ecosystem. So if we were to look at um, finding our ecosystem, you can say view Firebox integrations, and we can tie in with Splunk, we can tie in with Autotask, ConnectWise, Manage Engine, and it also gives you the integration guides as well. So again, part of these resources are just showing you where you can get additional help um, and where to go for the next steps. And I apologize if that was a review for some of you. Hopefully you find some of that useful and that you can go in there. Now, with WatchGuard firewalls, there are three ways that you can buy your firewalls. Actually, um, fourth way, which I'll cover as well, um, so most recommended is going to be total security, and that is the middle column. And as we look at total security, 
we are looking at, actually let's start out with the left column, which is support only. So support only is a stateful firewall. It does support VPN and it does have SD-WAN capabilities, software defined wide area network capabilities. Now with SD-WAN, we are looking at uh, three components, packet loss, latency, and jitter. And we're making informed decisions on which link, ISP, internet connection to go out. So if you do want to report on some of those metrics, SD-WAN, you don't have to have um, two external connections. You have to set up two external connections, but you can have one be false. And that way, uh, WatchGuard Cloud Visibility will start to report on what those metrics look like in your environment. Now that does include, that jumps down to WatchGuard Cloud Visibility data retention down there. Um, so you do need total security or basic security to have that visibility. But you can look at packet loss, latency, and jitter with SD-WAN. Now the important thing to realize, and we'll cover this a little bit later and probably in another series as well, is out of the box, the firewall does not have a feature key applied. Now if you go um, and apply a feature key and maybe that's expired and you remove that feature key, WatchGuard has a caveat that if it does not have the Firebox does not have a valid, or it could be an expired or a valid feature key, it will only allow one connection outbound. So even if it's an expired feature key, you need that in there to be able to have um, a stateful firewall for more than one connection. So that is support only, and then you get support 24 by seven as well. Then if you move to the far right, you're gonna look at basic security. So that includes all of what support had, now we are adding on additional services. So out of the gate, we have intrusion prevention services. And again, as we look at uh, you know update or vulnerabilities with different software packages, many of you may be using Flash or Adobe products that release regular updates to address vulnerabilities that people have found. Now, unfortunately, some of you maybe don't have a patch management solution. And if you're not familiar with um, a patch management, WatchGuard just acquired Panda Security a little bit ago, and we now can offer patch management for your environment. So stay tuned, let your local salespeople know if you wanna see a demo on patch management. But some of you are still under the mindset that your users are um, responsible for their own updates. And I could almost guarantee you, uh, coming out 15 years of experience in a school district, with that methodology or mindset that our users are responsible for their own updates, they are not happening, unfortunately. It's never an opportune time for your users to say, yes, install patch, uh, update now. So with that being said, intrusion prevention is a signature-based solution that's going to cover those vulnerabilities for you. Back in the day when we had Heartbleed come out, which was an SSL vulnerability, I had people contacting me and they said, Johan, I can't update 300 of my firewalls, my SSL engine on there. I need another solution. I said, well, guess what? We already have that signature through IPS, intrusion prevention signatures. So with WatchGuard, we have um, thousands of signatures that we're gonna be covering those vulnerabilities for you. Now, we also have application control. Application control in the old mindset was we're going to either allow or block certain applications on the network. Now, thankfully, we have evolved from there, and we can now say we want to go ahead and rate limit those traffic applications on the network. So in this day and age where we unfortunately have all of these um, children, all of these students at home doing distance learning, how do we ensure that we have enough continuity for those services that they need or that maybe we need working remotely that they're not monopolizing the network with some Netflix or YouTube 4K stream. What we can do is configure a traffic management policy for application control for streaming media that says they cannot exceed four megabits per second. So we're still going to allow it, but we're not gonna allow it to monopolize the network. And we'll go in and cover that in a um, future series as well. But extremely helpful on this day of um, where we have remote workers and students doing distance learning from home. We also have web blocker. So this one is near to, and dear to my heart. This is actually what led me to become a WatchGuard customer. I was using WebSense and uh, found out that WatchGuard was using WebSense. We were rolling out a BYOD where all these students would um, bring their devices on the network 
And ultimately, we were looking at about a 30% uptick on my WebSense licenses. Now, in a traditional model, people are paying a WebSense license per device. With WatchGuard, we simply rate, we simply um, size the box accordingly, and then you can flex up or down with your devices, and we don't have a per device charge in there. And we, um, coincidentally, we're using, um, we had WebSense as our web filtering engine at the time. So I said, well, I'm gonna um, become a WatchGuard customer. I saved about 21,000 on that deal for the district. Now, since then, uh, WebSense was bought out Ultimately, they're owned by Forcepoint, so you have all of that enterprise security through a web blocker. Now, we also have a spam blocker, so I realize that many of you are now moving your email services to the cloud, so this may not be necessarily of interest to you. This is only in line for hosted um, on-premise email servers. We are looking at port 25 um, as an SMTP and being able to block that as a proxy. Now we have gateway antivirus. So this is looking at um, the files as they're coming across the gateway, and we're going to apply signatures through there. This is through uh, Bitdefender, and we're able to see now um, if it's a zip, we can look inside the zip and see these files that are coming through and ultimately block them if they're bad. Reputation enabled defense is our cloud based authority reporting authority. So the, pre the basic premise is as I go to maybe look up uh, the latest uh, football scores, uh, Seahawks, I go to ESPN, my firewall says, has anyone out there that, well, sorry, my firewall contacts WatchGuard, and it says, has anyone checked out ESPN and run security services against this website? If so, we actually build a reputation on that on an object-based level. We can either give a fast pass or fast deny to that traffic. Now, that is much like a um, pre-check lane at the airport where you they've done a pre-screening and you get right in. So it's able to save about 20% of your um, processing power, your, give back that speed by not running it through a proxy and running all those security services through there. Now, with RED, we actually... Um, released another security service through RED, and that's our geolocation um, services. So now we can block traffic that goes to Russia, or we can block traffic that goes to Asia, and we can create those categories for our, let's say we have a development team, we can allow certain members of that um, network to be able to get access to those countries. We have network discovery. So this one is a great tool that runs through the Firebox UI that basically can scan your network and see what devices are on the network. Uh, so very critical in building a network map if you need it. We also have APT blocker. So this is our sandbox analysis that now as a file comes through, if we don't see it with gateway antivirus and if we don't see it with intelligent AV, which is our silence component, artificial intelligence, we're now running it through sandboxing pretending that we're a user and we're opening that up and trying to run that. And then we have our threat detection response, TDR, that's going to be able to correlate what traffic we have with what resources we have on the individual endpoints. So we're able to correlate that and make informed decisions, artificial intelligence on what to block. DNS watch, so this is ultimately looking at, um, you know, beyond port 80 or 443, with WebLocker, we're now looking at, is this uh, domain, does this resolve to a botnet? If so, block it, or perhaps there's a phishing attempt and we're doing fish user awareness. And again, we're gonna cover much more in depth in how to configure these in future sessions. We also have the access portal. So if you're not familiar with the access portal, that is now, um, gives you the ability as a network administrator to securely RDP into your environment proxying it through the firewall so you don't have to expose those RDP session natively. And then we have intelligent AV. Again, that's a silence. And then ultimately wrapping up everything, WatchGuard cloud visibility. We have 30 days of data retention within WatchGuard cloud visibility. And basic security gives us one day. Now, I talked to a number of people that say, well, why should I set up a WatchGuard cloud visibility if I only have basic? Very critical, you can see those, um, as I mentioned earlier, packet loss, latency, and jitter for SD-WAN, but you also get email reporting from the cloud, email alerts, right? 
perhaps your site goes down, you want to know about that. And previously with WatchGuard Dimension, which WatchGuard Dimension is still supported, that is our on-premise server. But with WatchGuard Dimension, you were, ne you were never able to get a notice that your site was down because it was inside that site most often. Um, and obviously, if the site goes down, it can't send out the email. With WatchGuard Cloud Visibility, we can send that email out because it's uh, through the cloud. So moving on, we have compare levels, technical support. Many of you are aware of our different uh, levels, but with a standard response time, there's a number of ways that we can um, uh, submit a support ticket. So we have web-based, phone-based support. I would highly recommend if it's not critical, you just go to the website and submit a support-based ticket. Now targeted response times there um, in a medium criteria would be four hours under standard. And under gold, you're looking at, um, sorry, eight hours under standard and then four hours for a medium or low. And then live call is critical uh, and you can support that. Now, if you are platinum for those larger enterprise accounts, you do get a technical account manager and then a quarterly account review from there. And as I mentioned, you do have some remote installation services that you can buy as well. So enough of that, let's go and dive a little bit more into how we can um, get into our planning, our configuration of our uh, firewall, our firebox. Now, the most important thing for you guys is to plan your environment, your config network configuration. So as we look at the most high level way that we can start to configure the firewall, it's what kind of mode are we going to want our firebox to be in? Now, the most common mode is our what we call mixed routing mode. If you use the web setup wizard, the firebox is automatically covered or configured in the mixed routing mode. It's the only mode that allows you to use all firewall or firebox features. Other modes will disable some of the features. For example, you cannot configure a VPN in bridge mode. So before you select a mode other than mixed routing mode, make sure you understand the limitations of that um, mode. So this is an example of a mixed routing mode where you can configure your interfaces, you can configure optional, trusted, and then your um, WAN interface or wide area network to the internet. We also have a drop-in mode. So what this would look like is that you can um, configure your router, your external interfaces, and then your trusted interfaces. Now, some of the, as I mentioned, drop-in mode and bridge mode are rarely used. So in a drop-in mode, all Firebox interfaces are going to be on the same network and have the same IP address. The computers on the trusted or optional interfaces can have a public IP address, NAT is not necessary. So a bridge mode, the important thing to realize about a bridge mode is it does not handle layer two or three information, which means you cannot configure routing, NAT, or VLANs. Okay, so that's important to think about. And I bring this up because I do have questions from people. I wanna put it in drop-in mode and they don't understand the uh, repercussions of putting it in drop-in or bridge mode. So in drop-in mode, the firebox cannot route VLAN traffic. We cover that dynamic routing, so that would be OSPF, BGP, or RIP is not supported. The Firebox does not support link aggregation, and you cannot configure more than one external interface, which means SD-WAN is not an option for you in drop-in mode. Now in bridge mode, there are a number, because we are not um, a number of restrictions, we are not handling layer two or three information. So this whole list, I'm not gonna read it for you guys. Um, you can read it yourself, or you can review the video or the resources online, you have a number of resources that are obviously not applicable for um, this environment. So again, I would highly recommend that you look at um, a mixed mode. So as we look at an interface overflow, so as we're just getting into, so we've opened up the firebox and maybe even before we are ordering that firebox, we are, designing a network schematic. Maybe it's a new network or maybe we're changing a network schematic and we're looking at what, how to be able to configure our firebox. So with the firebox, we have four types of network interfaces, also known as zones. We have our external interfaces and that's gonna be able to connect your firebox to the wide area network. So many times this is um, the ISP. We also have some, for instance, um, perhaps a, 
military contractor needs to have a zone, a secured zone inside of a, uh, behind another firewall. So maybe his external interface looks a little bit different than what a traditional external interface looks. So with that, you can have a static, see that I have a, um, a typo there, too much uh, fire smoke to the head, I guess. Um, so you can have a static IP address or a dynamic IP address. This is going to ultimately dis determine how and what functionality I can leverage from the firebox long-term, right? So WatchGuard has different um, technologies such as rapid deploy, which I can ship out a firewall to 50 different sites and have them plug it in. If it's a DHCP or um, a dynamic IP address, no problem, we can ship them all out and they will phone home to WatchGuard and join my management server if I wanted that way. If they have a static IP address, I just need to send them, for instance, a jump drive with their network settings, perhaps that's PPOE, um, but that's going to change how we configure the firewall. Then we have trusted interface. So that connects your Firebox to the private local area network or internal network that you want to secure. So typically you would use trusted interfaces for user workstations and private servers and that Firebox becomes the bridge for that. An optional interface is going to connect your Firebox to optional networks, which are mixed trust or DMZ. Typically you would see these as a public web server, FTP or web um, a mail servers. Now, as we look at moving to the cloud, that's going to change um, slightly. So with that being said, we have the only difference between trusted, optional, and custom interfaces is that which aliases the interface is a member of. All interfaces are a part of the any alias regardless of the interface type. Now, this will give you a picture here. Now, as we look at the interface overflow, or overviews, excuse me, typically your internet connection is gonna be on port zero. Um, or your leftmost port, and then your trusted is going to be on um, port one here. Now, what I recommend for a lot of you is that if you have enough uh, port real estate, you configure this um, rightmost so that if you have any issues, let's say you have a denial of service attack, you can run into your network closet and plug directly into this and be connected to your firewall. Now, some of you might have smaller networks where you actually don't have a trusted networks, and you want more than one of these uh, network ports to be part of trusted networks. So what you can do is create a bridge and that's going to essentially be a switch between these. Um, so three of these can now be a part of trusted networks. So typically we see these in smaller networks where they don't necessarily have a switch. So in this scenario, we would come out of um, the port one and we would go into a switch and that would serve up my trusted network as an optional network. So from there, I want to go ahead and I uh, see that we're at the top of that um, time, open up questions for Q&A. And while you're in there, I um, do have that survey link that Wendy was mentioning. Let us know if we are hitting the mark, hitting your expectations with these Firebyte sessions, what you would like to see. And certainly, and um, now that we have covered the basics, we have to have a proper foundation to build our house on, we will go dive in into um, many more uh, specifics as well. All right.